Erie, Pennsylvania is situated on the 11th largest freshwater lake in the world, and water is one of the region's most important natural resources. However, there are significant threats to water quality that need to be addressed in order to ensure a thriving, sustainable, and equitable future for the region. Penn Future and 12 regional organizations joined together to develop Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. This document prioritizes threats to clean water in the Erie region and recommends solutions at all levels of engagement to ensure that these resources are protected now and for future generations. And that's what we're going to discuss here with Penn Futures Campaign Manager for Clean Water Advocacy in the Lake Erie Watershed, Sarah Bennett. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a Contributing Editor at the Erie Reader. In this conversation, we're going to talk to Ms. Bennett to learn more about Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie Watershed. Now, Ms. Bennett is Penn Futures Campaign Manager for Clean Water Advocacy in the Lake Erie Watershed. She earned her bachelor's and master's degree in zoology at Michigan State University. After earning her degrees, uh, she spent 13 years teaching biology at the college level. She served as chairperson of the biology department and co-director of the environmental science program at Mercyhurst University for two years, and was also the university's sustainability officer for two years. Uh, she is a member of the Northwestern Pennsylvania chapter of Sigma Chi and the university's representative uh, on the Keep Erie County Beautiful Advisory Committee. Uh, she has organized many, many, many litter and dump site cleanups throughout the area. Now, folks, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, still send us along your questions, your comments. Let's keep the conversation going. We'll get them to Sarah. We'll make sure the conversation continues. And of course, for more information about uh, both upcoming uh, JES programs and publications, as well as a chance to visit the archive of past publications and the archive of videos to stream on demand, uh, visit our website, jeserie.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Ms. Sarah Bennett, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Thank you for having me. And no stranger to the JES platform you've presented before. This is the first digital one. So glad that we could do this together. Uh, for folks that uh, you know, might need a uh, refresher or may not be familiar yet uh, with Penn Future, uh, tell us a little bit more about the organization before we dive into your presentation on that common agenda, please. Sure. So Penn Future is a statewide environmental advocacy organization. We have four other offices throughout the Commonwealth, and I was hired this spring to open the Erie office. So it's our fifth office. Uh, Penn Future is dedicated to protecting clean air, clean water, and land and promoting sustainable communities throughout Pen, uh, Pennsylvania, including clean energy. So that's, that's a little bit about what Penn Future does. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. And as I ask you to pull up the PowerPoint, we kick into that presentation. Uh, I want to remind folks you can find them online uh, and you can also find them um, uh, various uh, social media channels. We're actually going to put a link to uh, the common agenda, uh, our water, our future, the common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed right in the comments section uh, so that you folks can grab that. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and do that uh, once Sarah is done with the presentation. I want you to give her your undivided attention. Let's roll through it and we'll make that link available just in a little bit. Sarah, back over to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really happy to be with you and share with you the this work. It's a collaborative uh, a collaborative document that I worked on with 12 local uh, partner organizations. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but the document is called Our Water, Our Future, A Common Agenda for Protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie Watershed. I've already introduced, uh, Ben has introduced me, and I've talked to you a little bit, little bit about Penn Future. Um, I began with Penn Future this spring. And my first order of business was to start having as many conversations as I possibly could about water and threats to water quality in the Lake Erie watershed. So what a, I mean, what a great job to have um, be able to talk to folks about water in Erie, Pennsylvania, where it's such a huge part of our lives. 
Uh, so I mentioned before, we have 12 signatory partners on the common agenda. They're listed here. So there are 13 of us, including Penn Future. Um, all of us work together through Zoom throughout the summer to identify threats to clean water and then brainstorm about solutions. We also had a technical advisory committee made up of four regional science organizations and conservation organizations, as well as several local scientists. And the, the, goal, the point to that was to make sure that this document was as well informed as it possibly could be. Um, finally, this document has a very strong call for addressing uh, in, uh, environmental justice and ensuring that we have inclusive decision-making processes. And so in order to make sure that that call was as strong as possible, we asked three local organizations, Erie County United, Green New Deal Coalition, and the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants in Erie to review that, this document and, and make sure that those, those calls were as strong as they could be. And they, this document definitely is much stronger from their, um, their due to their input. So I really want to thank everyone who, who participated in creating this common agenda. I also think um, that, or I also want to point out that there are several additional organizations who were working with us who are not listed here, kind of working in the background. And anybody, any other organizations or people who want to get involved are welcome to, to contact me as well. Um, I wanted to, before we kind of dive in and, and talk about the common agenda, I like to use this slide just to remind us why water is such an important asset to our region. So, you know, if, whether we're enjoying the beaches on Presque Isle or enjoying the wildlife that is supported by these awesome water resources, or fishing in one of our streams, or enjoying the Brig Niagara, or, or boating or sailing on Presque Isle, um, I think it's an understatement to say that our water resources are important to us here. Uh, our, our lives really depend on them and our livelihoods as well. So as Ben mentioned, I was a faculty member for many years prior to this. And in my lectures, I always like to start broad and then zoom in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that today too. Um, so I wanna start by looking at Lake Erie broadly, because I think it's really easy to, to forget how special this lake is. We're part of the largest freshwater system. You know, our lake is part of the largest freshwater system in the world. Um, it's, as Ben mentioned, it's the 11th largest lake in the world. Lake Erie specifically supplies drinking water to over 11 million people in two different countries and several states. Um, lake Erie, a lot of people don't know this, but Lake Erie supports the greatest number of farms of any Great Lake. It's also the shallowest and warmest lake and the most biologically productive. And those three, those three bullets right there give you a little bit of insight into, um, they, they play a big role in the harmful algal blooms that we see uh, kind of plaguing our, our beaches and increasingly so. And I'll come back to harmful algal blooms a little bit later, but um, that, that's one of the reasons they're such a big deal, especially in the Western Basin. You can see in this uh, map on the right here, the Western Basin over by Toledo, that, that is shallower than we are over here. So they have even more trouble with those blooms than we do. And then lastly, I also wanna point out that it may not feel like it in the winter months, but this lake moderates our climate uh, and that allows this fruit growing region and wine country that we so appreciate uh, in our region. So now we're gonna zoom in a little bit more and take a look at our special piece of, of the Lake Erie watershed and that's Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. It is mostly in Erie County, though not completely. So if you take a look at the map here on the right, this Southwest portion of the Lake Erie watershed does dip into Crawford County there. So in, interesting facts and, and important facts to know about our portion of the Lake Erie watershed is that it supplies drinking water to over 240,000 people. Uh, Presque Isle Bay, it was uh, delisted as a Great Lakes water quality uh, 
uh, agreement area of concern in 2013. And if you've been in Erie since then, you know we've, we've celebrated that fact. But it's also important to know that Presque Isle Bay and many of our streams are still listed as impaired by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And so they still need more attention. Um, also taking a look at our watershed in Erie County, it supports a $40 million fishing industry, a $1.2 billion tourism industry, and a $23 million agricultural industry. So we rely heavily on our water resources. And we need to make sure that they continue to be able to provide for us if we want to thrive into the future. All right, so now we're gonna really dive down and take a look at the common agenda that my partners and I published this summer. Well, it was published this fall, we worked on it this summer. Um, so what this is, is a plan for better protecting water quality. It's going, it identifies policy changes, decision-making practices, and collaboration in order as solutions to better protecting our water resources. The term common indicates that it was agreed upon. So all of the threats, all, this was a collaborative effort. So all of the threats, all of the uh, solutions were agreed upon by all partners before they signed on to the document. Um, like I said earlier, we met via Zoom throughout the summer. We started with identifying the threats. We have prioritized those threats based on, um, it, it was, you know, kind of a, it definitely wasn't a scientific process, but we just had a conversation about what are these threats and, and which is the highest priority based on impacts to the economy, impacts to ecosystems, impacts to human health. Um, really kind of impact to the future of the, the Lake Erie region. And then we brainstorm solutions. Uh, those solutions are at, you know, from municipal level to county to state to federal, um, and then also some recommendations to local organizations for, for better protecting these resources. And then finally, once we had a solid document, um, we did send it to those three social justice review organizations, again, to make sure we were making the strongest calls we could for environmental justice. Um, I do want to point out that we, you know, I started with reaching out with, to people who I already knew or organizations who I already knew, and then asked them, you know, just kind of by word of mouth, who, who else do I need to be talking to? And so I think if we were limited at all by the COVID shutdown, it was because we, I know that there are organizations and people who we were not able to reach. Um, and so this process of bringing on more partners and reaching out to people is certainly not over. And you know, anybody who's listening, if, if you want to participate or, or know someone or an organization who would like to, you're welcome to reach out. So the common agenda is a very comprehensive document. Um, it's about 50 pages long. And in order to make it easier to organize and easy to read, we separated it into nine different uh, parts. So the parts are listed here. I'm not going to go over them right now, but moving forward with today's talk, I'm gonna be talking in just a little bit of detail about parts one through seven. Um, what I present today is certainly not exhaustive of, of an exhaustive coverage of what's in the in the common agenda. So I recommend that you do read it. It's public publicly available, um, and feel free to reach out to me with questions too. All right. So first, I want to take a look at part one, and that's addressing racism and environmental justice. I think a lot of people are surprised to see this in the common agenda. You know, this is a policy document, maybe even a, a kind of a scientific document. But, and so some people are surprised to see this concept of addressing racism. Um, but while we were putting this common agenda together, Erie County um, passed a resolution, Resolution 43, saying racism is a public health crisis in Erie County. Um, for those of you who are watching or who, who view this this talk, I strongly recommend that you read this resolution. Um, it 
shows stark differences in health outcomes between people of color and people who are white living in Erie County. Um, and it, it's shocking how different, you know, the, the differences there, those discrepancies are shocking and we, it really makes the, we absolutely have to address this. So as you know, we originally, we wanted this document to in, incorporate environmental justice to begin with, but this made that need even stronger. Um, really every initiative needs to address racism as a public health crisis in Erie County. That's how we're going to address this. Um, but even more directly, we know that in Erie County and nationwide, environmental degradation and pollution disproportionately impact people of color. We saw that specifically with the Erie Coke Corporation. Um, Erie Coke was emitting illegal levels of benzene as well as other air pollutants. And those emissions were directly impacting or most closely impacting communities that uh, are considered environmental justice areas by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Pr Protection. So if we take a look at this map on the right, all of the pink areas are environmental justice areas as determined by the Department of Environmental Protection. So they, they determine this, and, and there are people who, you know, there's, there's some arguments about, you know, is this the best way to do this? But it is, this is what we have right now. Um, the, so what, what that is, is a census block where 20% or more of the people in, living in that block are living in poverty and or 30% of that population are minorities. And so you can see from this map that the city of Erie really is a collection of environmental justice areas, uh, but there are several additional areas throughout the Lake Erie watershed too. So this is all to say, we, we know that this exists. We know that this, the, these disproportionate impacts exist. Also, as I was doing research for this common agenda, I found an article that was published, a scientific article that was published last year um, that examined historically redlined communities across the nation and compared their temperatures during summer months to neighborhoods that were not historically redlined. And this found that there were significantly higher temperatures in historically redlined neighborhoods than in those that weren't. Um, and they did include Erie in that. And they found, what they found was during the study period in historically redlined neighborhoods uh, in Erie were 3.9 degrees Celsius warmer than non-redlined neighborhoods. That's about seven degrees Fahrenheit. So Sarah, what that, could, oh, go ahead, yep. Yeah, if I could just jump in, for folks that might be hearing this term, I know this is a term that's in the zeitgeist now and people are paying much more attention to it than historically we have in the past. But if somebody's uh, in need of a refresher or coming upon this term for the first time, can you give us a real quick definition of redlining? Sure, so redlining is a historical practice of um, basically, it's loan practices. So um, loans were not given to people who were deemed to be risky, um, and that was determined largely based on race. Um, and there are documents that show documents that actually list which which races, which and and ethnicities are poor, poor uh, or are a big risk, I guess. And um, that has had, you know, those practices ended um, by the 1960s, I think, maybe 70s, but their impact has certainly continued to this day. And reading some of that language, it is cringeworthy, uh, looking back how blatant some of this was to yeah. economically lock out uh, certain communities, certain neighborhoods where getting a home loan was much more challenging, getting access to any sort of equity was, was much more challenging. Sorry for interrupting, Sarah, but thank you nope. for that. I, I, this is such a, an important talk because I think some people coming upon this for the first time, the uh, marriage of uh, racism and environmental justice as a lens to look through, I think that's just so important to point out. So thank you for doing that. No problem. Yeah, and if you if you look at redlining, I 
it is cringeworthy is a good is a good way to put it but there are maps that actually you know you can see where people of color were kind of relegated based on these lending practices um, and those also are historically the places where you see industry and and polluting industries and and so um, it's had health health impacts for sure as well um, yes oh so what i was going to say is um the the fact that these are already warmer and this was again we saw this or the the researchers saw this across the nation indicates that a warming climate is likely to disproportionately impact people of color as well in cities so all of this is just information that we're, we're we know and so it it behooves us to do something about this if you know that something exists let's do everything we can to address it so in this document what we did um, you know and this is how i'm going to talk about this i'll kind of present briefly some of the threats and then talk about some of the solutions so some of the solutions that we have for addressing racism as a public health crisis uh, include establishing an erie county council environmental justice committee um, I'll be following up with Erie County Council and, and other elected officials moving into the new year. So what this looks like is really kind of up for discussion, but this is kind of a baseline idea for how, what can we do to address this. And so what we would say, what we call for is for this committee to monitor environmental violations and figure out who's, who's directly impacted by those by those violations or by polluting industries so that we can get a better handle on environmental justice. We also have recommenda recommendations at the municipal level. Um, what that looks like is going to depend on the municipality, their size, their capacity. But the, the gist of these recommendations is that we need to ensure that everyone has an equal seat at the table, that more people are included in the conversation so that we can have a better understanding of the impacts of decisions and come up with solutions that are more equitable by including more more voices at that table and so i had said that penn future is committed to uh, promoting sustainable communities we will never have sustainable communities until everyone has an equal has an equal seat at the table and has equal opportunities that's true sustainability um, moving on to part two of of the common agenda we identify that at this especially at the state level we need to adequate adequately fund water protection um, the pennsylvania dep department of environmental protection I has identified that there's an $18.6 billion gap in funding for water infrastructure uh, that exists. Pennsylvania is not alone there. And keep in mind, I'm focusing just on water infrastructure here, but across the nation, we have billions of dollars of, of infrastructure upgrades that are needed. But in Pennsylvania, and specifically for water infrastructure, that number is $18.6 billion. At the same time, our state agencies that are tasked, part, one of their tasks is to protect these resources. They've seen a 30 to 40% cut in their funding since 2002. And so we're, we're moving in the wrong direction there. And so solutions here are to restore funding to agencies, these agencies, uh, and also protect funds that exi already exist at the state level, uh, including the Environmental Stewardship Fund, also called the Growing Greener Fund, and other funds that already exist. Uh, these are often, often called special funds at the state legislature. They need to be protected and not raided in times of, you know, kind of budget problems, much like this year. Okay, so those first two, part one and part two, environmental or um, environmental justice and funding i see those as kind of indirect threats to water quality these next few that i'm going to talk about are more direct threats probably more of what you'd you'd expect uh, if you were if 
the, more of what you'd expect from a document like this, you know, the direct kind of more scientific threats to water quality. So part three is reducing water pollution and flooding due to surface runoff. This is actually identified in all of the conversations that I had as the number one threat to water quality is surface runoff. Uh, so what surface runoff is, is a, um, it's, it's the combination of stormwater runoff that we see in urban areas, agricultural runoff and sewage. And, and sewage is in the form of either overflows or maybe septic systems that aren't working very well. And I even include animal waste in there too. You know, if you take your dog to go to the bathroom, you don't pick up after them, that goes into our waterways. And so what this looks like is, what this surface runoff looks like, is anytime it rains or snow melts, or you know, name the other 10 types of precipitation we get in, in Erie, um, anytime you, you have that water moving over the surface, it's gonna move pretty quickly over paved surfaces. We call those impervious surfaces. It's gonna move over buildings, sidewalks, roads, and, any, and move through our lawns as well. Anywhere where it moves over, it's gonna pick up anything that's on the surface there and carry that directly into storm drains. Now, a common misconception is that those storm drains go to the wastewater treatment plant and the water gets cleaned and we put out this nice pure water back out into the lake. That's not the case. Most of these storm drains are going to drain directly into a stream that then goes right out to the lake or directly into the lake or, or uh, Presque Isle Bay. So they're gonna take all of these pollutants directly into our waterways. Um, and what that looks like, so to use a specific example of fertilizers, the fertilizers that we put on our lawns or you know, that businesses spray, put on their lawns, the fertilizers that uh, go into agricultural lands are all going, if anything excess is going to run off into our storm drains, directly into our streams, and then are going to result when climatic conditions are, are right, are going to result in something like this, which is called a harmful algal bloom. Um, this is an ex excess growth of cyanobacteria and algae. Many of those cyanobacteria produce toxins and those toxins can kill fish, they can kill dogs that drink that water and they can cause health problems for us. And what that, that also results in is beach closures or notices on the beaches that can also impact our economy. And so these are a pretty big problem and it's increasing as fertilizer increases, uh, fertilizer use, as precipitation increases and carries more water over land, and then um, also as the, the climate warms. So this is an issue that we, we all need to, to take steps to, to address. Um, before I move on to solutions here, I also wanna point out that uh, runoff does more than just carry pollutants into the water. It also, when water moves very quickly into those storm drains and very quickly into our streams and into Prescott, into the bay and into the lake, that can cause really rapid elevation in water levels as well. And that can result in pretty rapid flooding. And so solutions that are going to address this are also going to help with flooding issues that are increasing and are expected to continue to increase. Um, the, and then one last thing I wanna point out is that when water hits those streams really quickly, it increases erosion of the stream banks and you know, all that sediment, all the soil that, and the pollutants that are, exist in that soil are gonna run off into the stream too and increase sedimentation down, downstream. So that, lots of issues with runoff here. And so the solutions here, um, the, the kind of, I always say the cheapest solution, although not the easiest, the cheapest solution is to protect, is to allow nature to take care of this for us. If we protect our open spaces, our woods, our um, natural fields, 
our wetlands, if we protect those spaces, they're going to naturally control the, this runoff. And so what happens is that if that water goes into a wetland, for example, or into a wooded area, the water is going to be absorbed by the soil or it's gonna, it's gonna seep into the soil and that slows it down. The other thing that happens is plants like trees and, and plants with good root systems are going to absorb some of that water. And so the effect of soil and plants absorbing water is going to slow that water down. So now we're, we're addressing the flooding issue. We're addressing the stream bank issue. The other thing that happens though is that those plants are going to filter a lot of those pollutants from the water before it gets into the streams too. And so if we allow nature to do this, then you know that saves us a lot of money, it saves us a lot of trouble, and that, that's really kind of the, the I say easiest way to, uh, to protect, to, to address this problem. Now in a, in a city like Erie, a lot of that is already paved and built. And so people are like, well, what can we do? Because we, I mean, you can build wetlands, but you're not likely to build a giant wetland in the middle of the city, right? <laughs> so um, what we can do is install different elements that are collectively called green stormwater infrastructure. And this picture that you see here is an example of green stormwater infrastructure in Pittsburgh. Uh, what happens here, and you probably can't see it very well, but there's a little hole on the side by the sidewalk where water is going to run off from the sidewalk down into this planter box. And this planter box is going to have lots of native plants and an engineered um, substrate that's going to allow that water to be absorbed and filtered before it then gets into the storm drain. So this is just one example of green stormwater infrastructure. Um, there are lots of examples of this, but if we just start kind of thinking about this, it basically is a nature-based infrastructure that helps reduce runoff, filter, to, filter the water, and reduce flooding as we move along. So moving on to part four, um, this part is addressing climate change and extreme weather. Again, looking at the issues and, and what we already know is that Erie is warming. Climate Central identified that Erie is the eighth fastest warming city in the United States. We know that we've seen an increase in precipitation. We know we've seen an increase in extreme rain and snow events. So climate change includes increases in extreme snow events too. Uh, I'll use this picture on the bottom. This is my husband shoveling, hand shoveling the snow during our extreme snowmageddon event that happened a few years ago over the Christmas holiday. Um, just as an example, that, that's what we can expect. More of that, those types of things. Um, and then we also know that in the last few years, we've seen higher levels of precipitation across the Great Lakes Basin that has led to record water levels. Um, and that has resulted in the erosion, like what you see here, this is in the Erie region, erosion that results in the, the need to um, build new, uh, new walls to, to keep the water away from our, away from our land. Um, and, you know, if we're at Presque Isle, increased need to replenish the sand as well. So lots of erosion there. Um, and then as far as solutions go, there are some things already happening. So um, addressing the climate action plan, including protect, uh, there's already one that's in place at the county level, not in place, being worked on, being developed at the county level. Um, we need to make sure that that also includes our most vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Um, establishing a tree management program. And uh, I'm going to skip through some of this because I'm looking at our time here and <laughs> I've been rambling already. Um, at the state level, Pennsylvania, it has already started the rulemaking process for entering the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, there's a lot going into that, but what that is, is that it's a 
a method for reducing emissions while also generating revenue. I think I've heard $300 million um, could be generated by this process that could then be reinvested to continue um, efforts to reduce emissions. All right, so um, what I'm gonna do, well, Ben, what do you want me to do? Do you, as far as time goes, do you want me to? I would say, Sarah, you're far from rambling. This is all important. I, 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 there's plenty here I'm being blown away by from learning that Erie is the eighth, uh, uh, eighth in the number of cities warming the quickest, the most quickly. Um, so let, let's continue to go through the parts here and, okay. uh, you know, we, we can take a little bit more time because I, I, I don't want to rush you through it. So let's sure. look at part five. Let's look at part six, uh, for folks looking at their watches and may, may have plans, uh, to do something after this event, uh, part seven, that's the final one, Sarah. And then we'll do just a couple of quick questions, some follow-up after this, but this is all fascinating and important. Um, and trying to encourage people to take a look at that common agenda. So I'm going to turn it back to you and say, let's keep going through this. All right, sounds great. Thanks, Ben. So um, with this part five, so taking a look at part five, um, this is limiting damage caused by fossil fuels and plastic. So obviously this is fossil fuel burning is related to climate change as we've already talked about. We really, I mean, the big picture is we need to move away from fossil fuels um, in order to address climate change, but also address water and air pollution caused by this this economy that, that relies on fossil fuels. Um, but more specifically in the Erie region, we don't have fracking in the Lake Erie watershed. We're fortunate there um, from an environmental perspective. But we do have 163 known abandoned and orphaned conventional wells from past, you know, wells that were, were dug in the past. Um, those, as they're sitting there, they can emit volatile organic compounds, methane, they can leak and get into groundwater, so they can cause all kinds of environmental problems. Um, also, in the past and not too distant past, we've had salt brine from both conventional and fracking um, wells be applied to our dirt roads. Um, salt brine kind of makes you think salt water and that's what people think, but when those are coming out of the earth, they have heavy metals in them and radioactive materials in them that when sprayed on the on dirt roads and then when the rain falls, it washes into our streams. Also in Erie, we have um, an issue with plastic pellets, also called nurdles. I use plastic pellets myself, um, the term. <laughs> the, um, what we know is that these plastic pellets are coming into Erie County. Uh, often by rail. The picture that you see on the top here was provided to me by Dr. Sam Mason. Um, and what she's found is that these nurdles are escaping the rail cars as they come into our, as they come into our county. Um, what happens then is again, when it rains or even wind, these are light enough that wind can blow them too. When it rains or snow melts, these plastic pellets are getting into our waterways. The um, problem there is not just that plastic is getting into the water, but what happens is once that plastic is in the water, it absorbs persistent organic pollutants, it attracts bacteria, and then fish and birds are going to mistake this, these pellets for food, and they're going to consume that plastic, fill up on it instead of their own food, but also will be ingesting the bacteria and the persistent organic pollutants that can then become incorporated into their bodies. Um, and then we have our Erie Coke site. I like this, this aerial image. <laughs> it shows you the black, um, the black land that's there from the decades of coal that were delivered and, and was processed at this plant. So as far as solutions go, um, a lot of these are more at the, the state level, uh, state level solutions here. So, We'd like to see legislation to control plastic pellet pollution. We'd like to see the state invest in abandoned and orphaned well plugging. This is an issue throughout the state. Um, if so, Penn, Penn Future published a document called a Green Stimulus 
and recovery platform for Pennsylvania this summer. And we identified kind of the level of, of investment to plug all of these well, the known wells over the next four years. And so Erie County would, would stand to get, based on our 163 wells, a little over $8 million to do that. Um, we'd like to see a permanent moratorium on, on salt brine application to dirt roads. And we'd like to see drilling waste from fracking and conventional drilling defined as hazardous waste so that you know, it has to be disposed of um, more than just going directly into our, our standard landfills. Um, with part six, controlling invasive species in the Lake Erie watershed, uh, all of the characteristics that bring people and business to Erie also make it easier for invasive species to come here. So that includes aquatic species that come through boats and ships, you know, in our commercial port, and also our fishing industry can, can bring people with their boats here and invasive species can, can tag along there too. Um, but it also includes terrestrial invasive species like the spotted lanternfly, um, emerald ash borer. If you try 79, you're gonna see dead ash trees all along there because they're, they're hitching a ride with the wood we're carrying with us along those, those roadways. Um, so the thing with invasive species is they're a lot easier to stop and, can, and get under control before they become invasive than they are to address once they've established in an area. Now we have a lot of state agencies in the area that are working on invasive species. We already, they've already put together a Lake Erie Watershed Cooperative Weed Management Plan. What, I, what we recommend is that more organizations and municipalities engage with that plan so that we take an all hands on deck approach to preventing the establishment and spread of invasive species. We also recommend that the state create a watercraft inspection and decontamination program. Other states have this so that our state agencies have more power to inspect watercraft and, and prevent invasive species. And then finally, um, our, the last part here is addressing legacy pollution and promoting more sustainable, a more sustainable future. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone in Erie that our industrial past has left us with contaminated land and water um, and air. <laughs> So we also recognized or listed the toxic chemicals of mutual concern from the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, in our waterways, mercury and PCBs are of special concern and PFAS is kind of an emerging group of chemicals that we're starting to learn a little bit more about. So that's just a few of the, the threats based on legacy pollution. And what we recommend there to address this is incentivizing brownfield development. Instead of people and developers um, and companies coming in and developing on, on land that's never been developed, what we call green fields, let's incentivize them to develop in brownfields. Um, we also would like to see brownfields utilized for the green stormwater infrastructure that I talked about earlier. Cities like Cleveland and Buffalo are already doing this. And then we'd also like to see increased protection along waterways. You know, maybe we shouldn't have um, industries that are either producing or using hazardous wastes functioning along waterways. And so that's really just kind of an introduction to this common agenda. Um, really to, to summarize, we know that Erie is looking for transformative change. Erie is revitalizing right now. Um, and so what we're calling for is to insert water protection and human health into that conversation. Um, because only through collaboration and inclusion can we have true sustainable transformative change and equitable decision making that will raise all boats and, and really result in this kind of thriving sustainable Erie that we're all really hoping for and working for. So thank you very much. I am happy to answer questions. Um, here's my contact information if you'd like to follow up.
You can also go to penfuture.org. There's lots of resources there about water and ant land and other things that Penn Future is doing across the state. Thank you. Sarah, a, a big thanks. You know, you said it, it, it is a common agenda that is more than uh, 50 pages long and you managed to get through in less than one minute per page walking us through that document. An impressive feat, uh, not something to be taken lightly. So thank you for doing that and introducing a lot of folks to this topic and to these topics to dive in and look at the threats that you've identified and, and not just point them out, but then offer recommendations and solutions. So grateful for you there. Uh, on the screen still folks, a way to get in touch with uh, Ms. Bennett. It, it is B-E-N-N-E-T-T -T at penfuture.org. Uh, you can also find more information, including uh, that common agenda uh, by headed over to penfuture.org. Uh, we've posted a link to that in the comment section of the JES Facebook page where this event was being hosted live. Uh, so you can check it out there. Uh, Sarah, we do have a couple of questions uh, in the comment section. And one was uh, something that you and I had talked about um, you know, offline leading up to this event is that I, I, I bet that people were going to wonder the sequencing. What comes next? What are the next steps? And in fact, people are asking that. So uh, in the short term, what does it look like moving forward into 2021? And then, you know, mid range, you know, if we're back here having this conversation again, a year from now in 2021, December, 2021, uh, what do we hope to have accomplished uh, because of this common agenda? And then looking further into the future, uh, just briefly, what are the next steps sequencing short term, mid range, long term? Sure. So the first thing is, you know, doing what we're doing right now, getting getting these ideas out there, letting people know that the common agenda exists. Um, you know, this, as comprehensive as this document is, it, like I said, there are still more voices out there. And so we really want this to be the start of a conversation. So what we're going to be doing moving forward is briefing um, municipalities, briefing and, and county governments, as well as our state legislators on the common agenda. Um, in January and February, that's the plan. Um, and then having follow-up conversations about those as well. So the partners and I will be meeting with those um, entities to um, have those follow-up conversations and say, you know, here, here's what we, what we think needs to happen and this is why. Um, then continuing to move forward, I, what we'll do is we'll take a look at things that already have, be, that have already begun so things like the county climate action plan. We know that Crane and um, the county are already working on this. So we'll kind of see, you know, where are they in that process? Are there barriers? Is there anything we can do as partners to help move that forward? Um, another example of something that's already underway are the stormwater fee feasibility studies that Mill Creek Township and the city of Erie are, um, have already started. Again, you know, let's see where we are in the process. Where can we help? How can we how can we move that move that forward? So that's kind of near term. Um, probably over the next year, that's what we'll be working on. Hopefully, we'll also have some additional conversations to to you know move this. It may even move in directions that we don't even know, and that that will be wonderful. Um, five years down the line, what I would love to see is the. Region, Erie region solidly identifying itself as a Great Lakes community. Um, you know, we kind of already feel that, but I'd like to, it'd be great to even see that as, in policy as well. Um, I'd like to see policies and practices addressing each of these threats. I, you know, I, realistically, I know we're not going to get everything that's in here, but if we could have, you know, a little bit from each, you know, little category A, category B, that would be great. Um, and then really, what would be amazing is to make, you know, insert water protection and human health into all of the big kind of development decisions that are happening in Erie. And I, I can't help but think that if we have the Erie region identifying itself as a Great Lakes region and really thinking of that, putting it, putting that, uh, you know, forefront of our identity, because I, I, I can't help but think the thing that differentiates us from other small to mid-sized metro areas is the fact that we're on a Great Lake and, and it's right here. It's what makes us us. But I think that maybe there's that ripple out potential of Pennsylvania really recognizing its place as a Great Lakes state. Uh, you know, certainly we don't occupy the same amount of shoreline as a Michigan, for instance. However, we're still part of that watershed. So I, 
I see this as, as a long-term project and I get where you're saying moving forward, uh, you know, with the short-term goals and throughout the year. One of those thinking regionally, a question that uh, somebody had asked is, is to go back to the R, uh, RGGI, the Regional uh, uh, Greenhouse uh, Gas in, uh, Initiative. What does it take to get Erie to be part of that? Where are we in that process? How can we be part of that is what this person's asking in the comment section. Sure. So. Um... They just, I think it was just last Friday, they had um, hearings, pub public hearings on Reggie. They wanted to hear, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so I guess I would say, you know, get, and one way to do this easily is, you know, if you want to join the Penn Future email list, we'll put out action alerts and say, hey, this is happening. You know, you should, you should participate. Anyone can participate in that. Um, so basically, they just heard from the public, you know, what do you think about this? Um, do you support it? Do you not? That kind of thing. So anybody can do that. I would say um, get involved, let your state legislators know that you support, support Pennsylvania joining this process. Um, we're in the, this is going to be a couple of years process to, to you know, make sure that we're in, it, um, develop it properly. But you know, also I think share your concerns about it or questions that you have about it with your state legislators um, to, so that we can, it can develop in the most meaningful way. So Sarah, I'd, I'd love to have you back and let's talk more about our water, our future, uh, because there is so much to go through. And, um, you know, perhaps this is the first of several conversations that we can queue up as, we, you know, folks continue to take a look at that. We've provided a link in the comment section of, of this JES uh, Facebook live event where folks can find that, certainly more information. But final question here, uh, one of the viewers is asking, what can citizens do when it comes to playing a role in keeping water clean? And then as advocates, what can citizens do? So what are we looking to do just in our daily habits? Uh, what good recommendations? How do we take that first step and otherwise to, to be a part of this process, to keep our water clean? And then how do we get involved if folks are interested in becoming an advocate for this? Sure. So um, first of all, I think what everyone can do is recognize that almost every single action from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed at night is going to impact our water. Um, you know, all of the stuff that we use on our bodies gets washed down into the drain. And a lot of that is ending up into our lake. So making choices about products that we use, use less, use, you know, be informed about what you're using and what you're pushing, putting down the drain. Um, outside, and this is probably even more important, is be, you know, taking care of our lawns in a really water friendly way. So minimizing the water you put on your lawn but also minimize the chemicals that you're putting on your lawn. Um, reduce or eliminate fertilizer and pesticides. We really, in order to be the most wa water friendly we can with our lawns, have to change what those, change our, our thoughts about what that lawn should be. Um, planting native plants and um, you know, moving away from that really broad expanse of, of beautiful green grass, um, that's, like the least environmentally friendly thing we can do. So <laughs> embrace the clover that our native insects love so much um, and save yourself some money too and reduce the, the fertilizers and the pesticides and everything that we put on our lawns too because that's all washing directly into those storm drains and right into our, our waterways. I, I remember a presentation uh, that, that uh, Sam Mason, Dr. Sam Mason gave at the Jefferson uh, Educational Society a while back. And I remember for the first time, I had never thought of it, that some of the ingredients in the products we use are not natural, that there are plastic microbeads and some exfoliants. And, and that's something that I had never thought of or thought to even think about until she had given that presentation. So I think being mindful of what we're using, what it contains and, and how, how, where it goes after we're done with it. I don't think many of us necessarily always think once it goes down the drain, where does it head after that? Certainly important to do that. Uh, for the people looking to uh, become advocates in this process, uh, Sarah, wh where do we point them? How do we get them started to take that first step? Yeah, so um, I would say you, you're welcome to email me. I can it, put you in touch with other organizations or you know, do your own research and find an organization that fits with what you're doing or what you're interested in. So basically I'd say get involved. Um, you can volunteer with one of the numerous environmental organizations. 
um, I would say start participating in our in our governance too. If something's happening and it's impacting, and it, you know you have an opinion of it, there are lots of ways that you can be heard. And I don't think a lot of people, and even I underestimated the the level at which I could be participatory. I could participate um, before I had this position. So every city council meeting, every county council meeting, they they hear from the public, and you have a right as the public to talk about that. You can write, you can email, talk to your legislators. They need if if we don't tell them how we feel about things, they're not going to know. So. Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, you can you can take personal action, you can get involved with organizations through volunteering, you can, um, you know, participate more fully in our democratic process too. So lots of lots of ways that we can be involved. And a friendly reminder for folks looking to reach out, it is Bennett. Uh, her name is there on the screen right now, B-E-N-N-E-T-T -E -T -T at penfuture.org. But Miss Sarah Bennett, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and taking the time, energy, and effort to share them all with us here in the conversation to discuss Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. So Sarah, again, we mentioned that uh, your email address uh, for folks looking to connect with Penn Future. What's that website again? It's uh, www.penfuture.org. So it's P-E-N-N-F-U-T-U-R-E.org. Wonderful folks, head over there. You're going to find that common agenda. And thanks to you, you folks, for tuning in, for watching along, making all of this go to be a part of this conversation. We are grateful for your attendance, your participation, uh, your involvement. We look forward to having you back again with future uh, JES digital programming. A friendly reminder to stream other JES digital programs on demand. Head over to our website, jeserie.org. Uh, you're going to find details there about upcoming programs as well as a wide range of publications, all archived from quick, timely reads to reports to essays and more free to download a couple of them taking a look at environmental issues from uh, glass recycling to habs we talked about those harmful algal blooms you'll find some research there on our website and of course be sure to connect with us on your favorite social platform uh, like us on facebook follow us on twitter and instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel for the jefferson educational society i'm ben spagan be safe be sound and thanks for listening and learning with us